Carter is uh, the global CISO for Checkpoint. One of those old, reliable, secure uh, security platforms, firewalls in the old days, we used to call it. Now they're security platforms. Um, and she's going to talk about something that everybody's talking about, given her perspective on AI. Uh, what are the risks? What are the rewards? and the relationships. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Cindy, and she's going to give you her perspective on all of this stuff that everybody's talking about, some people are threatened about, um, some people are excited uh, that the busy work uh, that, uh, that, we all, that all challenges us, uh, that AI can take care of that. Um, so, Cindy, take yeah, it away. Thank you. you bet. I appreciate you. All right, I'm, I'm on, right? You can all hear me okay? All right. Good morning, Houston. There we go. I think people have gone from happy hour to hangover hour right now, right? So I'm the only thing between you and maybe some more caffeine, because believe it or not, I haven't had any caffeine yet, and you don't want to see what happens after I do. So I am, I'm so excited to be here. This is my first time at HughesecCon, not my first time giving this presentation, I promise. I'm not trying it out on you. Um, but I, I really started thinking about this concept of understanding not only the risks, the rewards, but our relationship with artificial intelligence. And so for those of us here in this room, and it doesn't matter what your role is, anyone from uh, a chief information security officer, to an engineer, to sales, to a SOC analyst, right? We're all part of technology, and believe it or not, we have a relationship with it, right? Kids nowadays are being born with an iPhone 15 in their hands, am I right? Kinda, sorta, okay. So, in, in some way, shape, or form, um, we've all got a relationship with technology, and, and one of the things that I started thinking about is, well, artificial intelligence has been around for a while, but the thing about what, where we're talking about this as an emerging technology is because of how rapidly it has emerged over the last few years, especially because of the introduction of OpenAI, a generative platform that was introduced last November. So as I was over in um, Las Vegas in August at Black Hat, did anybody go to Black Hat? Anyone? It was, it was massive this year, right? I mean, it just gets bigger and bigger. And I was in a CISO summit, and one of the things that we talked about in there um, were relationships. And not just relationships with technology, but relationships with each other. And uh, Joe Sullivan, if any of you remember um, the former CISO from Uber, and it's probably still being um, handled in court, he actually presented and he said one of the things that was most important to him as he was going through that um, was his relationships with, with his comrades in this space. So I started thinking about our relationship with technology, our relationship with AI, and that's how I started writing this presentation. So I'm not billable, I carry no quota, I'm not gonna sell Checkpoint, that's what the folks in the booth are all about, but I'm here to share with you some of those perspectives. And by the way, last but not least, Happy Friday the 13th, right? Here we are. Does anybody have a birthday today without revealing the year? We don't want that PHI out there. Does anybody have a birthday? Anyone have a Friday the 13th birthday? Because it's, it's supposed to be good luck if it's your birthday, right? Well, if, even if it is your birthday and you don't want, you know, people coming up and giving you gifts and everything, happy birthday. All right, so here we go. Let's dive in. So while we're talking about relationships, Oh, boy, that got really loud all of a sudden. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about me with you that you won't find on LinkedIn. Um, I started my life in Detroit with an ice rink on every corner. And for 11 years, I trained for the Olympics in figure skating. So technology was not really part of what I imagined my life would turn out to be. Um, but by the time I was 15 years old, I realized I was not going to be one of the four folks that were chosen for the Olympic team that year. And that's okay. 
I, I came to terms with it. I still love figure skating. Anybody um, skaters out there? Ice or hockey, figure skating? Yes? Okay. We got a little bit of that going on here. So I set my sights on college. My mother was a nurse. My dad worked at IBM. So I was very influenced by healthcare. I felt that special calling. But my dad could take me to work with him on Take Your Kid to Work Day because my mom couldn't. I was bumping into IV poles all day long. So I'd go to work with my dad and play on the computers, right? So when I started college, I, I decided I would pursue um, pre-med. And about halfway through and, and staring at, you know, eight plus years of medical school debt, I decided, you know what, I need to pay my parents back for all the coaching and the equipment and the competitions and all the ice time because it's hundreds of dollars of, an hour um, from my skating career. And so I made the, the transition over to IT and got a computer science degree. So with that in mind, um, whoop, let's pop this up. I moved um, to what is known as the land of the meat sweats. I never heard this term before, about 16 years ago. Now, I know you all love your barbecue here in Texas, but I live here now. Ooh, I heard some oohs out there, okay. So, uh, or now people are saying that the Taylor Swift Chiefs, right? Oh, don't even get me started on that. But anyway, I tell people, yes, while I may live in Chiefs Kingdom, I still have the heart of a lion. And that first game this season where the Lions beat the Chiefs, oh wow, I bet that really messed up everybody's fantasy football. All right, so with that in mind, um, I did pursue a career in IT, and I've done everything um, hands-on, pulling cable, racking and stacking servers, firewalls, writing code, and everything else. And about 12 years ago, I took that fork in the road and went into cybersecurity. And I think that part of that calling was also with, um, are we doing okay? I hear a little popping going on. Are we all right? Need me to adjust? We okay? Give me a thumbs up. Okay. Um, I took uh, that fork in the road, and cybersecurity felt um, like it, it really helped me define my purpose. It was right along there with healthcare, and in human safety is really where I found that. Now, like I said earlier, it doesn't really matter what your role is within uh, cybersecurity, right? We're all here for a common purpose, and that's to make the world a safer place. And that is an excellent foundation for building a relationship. And that's what brought me, again, to the topic about AI. So as we go into this, um, we're going to dive into the meat of it. No pun intended. Did you get that? OK. Um, so do I have any military folks here? Raise your hand. I can see you. OK. So BLUF, or bottom line up front. I once reported to a CIO who was a staff first sergeant in the Army. And he said, I want you to use bluff or the bottom line up front every time you send me an email. I don't need all the background. I don't need all the story around it. Tell me in the first two sentences exactly what it is you need from me, you want me to do, um, or if it's just a status update. And it really helped me start to shape how I like to deliver presentations because at the end of the day, you know, there's only so, many, so much that you, you all can remember from all the presentations that you're seeing at the conference, right? So I break it down into three things. Why, what, and how. And so for this presentation, we are going to talk about why artificial intelligence is important in our world. It may sound obvious, but sometimes it's important to address, okay, why all the hype? Why is this all of a sudden an emerging technology, and not only that, but a rapidly emerging technology? And then, of course, we're going to talk about some of the what. You know, we're going to talk about that relationship part with it. And then we're going to talk about how. How are we going to harness the power of it, and how are we going to manage the risk to it? Because at the end of the day, when our, our CIOs, our CTOs, and the business want to use technology to innovate, to grow the business, to, you know, decrease our bottom line, to increase operational efficiencies, whatever the reason for it is, they always look to the security folks to figure out how we're going to make it secure, right? Do we have all the answers? Hello? Do we? Does the CISO have all the answers? Hell no! But we're here to all figure this out together. All right. So let's dive into the why. Why is it important? So back in the day, there were humans without computers, right? They wrote things down with pen and paper. They had their own thoughts. They might have even written it down on a stone wall in a cave. But that's how they communicated with each other. 
But in those days, there was very little information sharing. You had your own thoughts. You may sit down and, and talk to your neighbor a cave or two over, but that's pretty much about it. Now, with the invention of computers, that's where you're now able to share information because computers enabled us to store that data in places that it could be shared. And that helped businesses grow, right? So think about you know, the adoption of technology that's so important to businesses today. Because if you don't adopt, you're gonna get left behind. And then fast forward to this thing called artificial intelligence. So humans plus the computers plus artificial intelligence. And what artificial intelligence helps us do is, is, is amass tons of data and start to look at the patterns and the relationships on that data so that we can make decisions. And that decision-making power is what is behind AI in our world today. So with that in mind, I always like to throw a few quotes in here. Some of the, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or the FUD, behind AI is that it's going to take our jobs away, or it's anyone's job away, not just in the security space. And I always answer to that, you know, look, um, as a chief information security officer, I have spent months, hours, do you want me to switch? Is it too much? It's technical. Okay. All right. Is this, all right. Are we good? Okay. I'm going to have to do this two-handed now. I talk with my hands, though. All right, I'll figure it out. Okay, so um, where was I? So I spend a lot of time working with human resources, interviewing and curating every single important person that's on my team. AI is not going to replace their jobs. What it will do is help to alleviate some of those mind-numbing tasks that maybe a SOC analyst is, analyst is faced with day in and day out. The alert fatigue, we've all heard that term before. So that's going to then free up those folks to work on some of those security projects like, oh, we need to migrate. <clears throat> Are we good? Okay. We need to migrate these workloads to the cloud, and we need to figure out how we're going to go do that securely. We need to go back and look at that code. We need to look at the infrastructure, make sure that our architecture is sound. It's going to free those people up to be able to do that meaningful work. So no. In my opinion, it's not going to take anybody's job away. Think about in terms of technology um, back in, in the automotive industry and when the manufacturing lines were then equipped with some robotics that could build some of the parts or that could put some of the frame together. Did that take jobs away? No, it created jobs. It created the ability for the auto manufacturers to produce cars better, faster, higher quality, and the list goes on. All right, so there is also another new role that is emerging with uh, artificial intelligence, and it's called the CTO, and it's not the chief technology officer, it's the chief trust officer. And that chief trust officer is someone who is now responsible for the ethical, the moral, and, and the responsible use of AI so that the, the data that we're amassing and the decisions that we're seeing aren't creating unethical bias or unintended bias in the data results. They have to work very closely with our legal teams and our privacy teams. And by the way, we are in unprecedented territory, uncharted territory, when it comes to legal precedents with artificial intelligence right now. We are still trying to figure this out. So that's where a role of the chief trust officer is going to come into play. All right, so now I've described the why, why it's important in our world, and now we're going to talk a little bit about those relationships. So here is a little history, well, not really a history lesson. It really is a lesson about artificial intelligence in general. I always like to make sure I'm setting the context here correctly. So artificial intelligence, which actually really started with the rise of the machines, if you will, computers, um, you know, back in the 1950s. It was called artificial intelligence because microchips were created and, and computational mathematical algorithms were created to help processes move faster, help automate processes and things like that. That's what the age of artificial intelligence brought us. Now, when you fast forward to around starting in the 1980s, machine learning is actually a subset of artificial intelligence. And machine learning maps the data inputs to a specific output. 
An example of that are AI-driven applications. So who in here has used Spotify or Netflix, right? Most of us have. Spotify, you choose the type of music that you want to listen to. Netflix, you choose the type of movie you want to watch. And then it gives you, you know, some, some choices based on the data that they've amassed with, okay, maybe you chose country music, maybe you chose rock and roll. It'll give you those selections based on the data that it's amassed in that application. But it's your input. Your input is what's giving that output. So it's a mapping in machine learning of that. Now, taking that a step forward, oh, and by the way, because of the choices that you made, what does it do? It suggests, hey, by the way, you might like to listen to this new artist. You might want, like to watch this new movie, and so on and so forth. But then fast forwarding over into deep learning, which is a subset even further of machine learning, this is where, and, and, and the term learning is, is appropriate here, this is where the neural network starts to get into play. And this is massive amounts of data that the computational algorithms are then able to create those patterns and relationships and recognition. And that is the age that we are now breaking through into here. That is the rapid evolution of artificial intelligence today. And platforms like OpenAI that, that started last November 2022, the generative AI, which is what that's called, and I'll talk about that here in just a minute, the generative AI is, is what we are now in this world learning about and figuring about how, how, to, how to use it to our advantage. But guess what? You know, there's going to be people out there that want to use it against us as well. They're using it for their own profit and gain. But stepping back for just a minute to the data, our world is all zeros and ones, right? Bits and bytes. No matter how you slice it and dice it, the data sets in artificial intelligence have what is known as a temperature. Do I have any data scientists in here? Anyone willing to admit they're a data scientist? Okay. So the zero and one is super important in artificial intelligence because the data set only goes from a temperature rating of zero to one. Zero is the more factual information. It's more um, black and white. There's not a lot of um, um, difference in the data itself. It's very, very much based on facts. And as you go in 0.1 or maybe 0.2 increments towards the number one, that's how the data gets more randomized. That's how the data gets more creative, and that's where you may have heard the term hallucination. So as the data moves towards, towards one, especially in generative AI, and, and depending on the, the, um, the learning model you have, that's where the more creativity happens in the results that you get from that generative AI like ChatGPT. Does that make sense? Did you all learn something here now about data and temperature? Zeros and ones, folks, that's what it's all about. Okay. So raise your hand if you've played with one of these generative AI platforms like ChatGPT, Dolly, any of those, right? It's kind of fun. You know, when you, whether you're doing it for personal or business use, mo mostly personal at this point, um, to you know, kind of figure out what's going on with it. Um, it's quite entertaining, quite frankly. And that's where you know, we've got um, the, the risks, as we talked about earlier, are the uncharted territory with it. Because you've heard the term, um, garbage in, garbage out. So it depends on which learning model you're using, which data set you're using, as to whether or not you really can trust the results that that generative AI platform is giving you with whatever input you give it. So again, proceed with caution. But what's cool about generative AI is that's where it goes into um, whatever it is that you type in, and it creates new images or new texts based on the, the data that's already there, okay? So that's the learning part of generative AI. Now, going back to the relationship thing. This is where it's getting really interesting in our society. Oops, did I? Oh no, I'm, I'm okay. Here we go. Is it there? Yep, all right. So this is a quote directly from Time Magazine about um, human romances starting to happen from AI. Okay, we're gonna, I'm going to share with you a little bit of a story here. But we also know that AI is being used in healthcare. It's being used to help um, make 
better clinical decisions based on the amassed data. Let's say a patient presents with a certain set of symptoms. We can look at that data set. We can then um, look at the different patterns in that data about how those symptoms presented, and clinicians can come up with a better treatment plan for them. So AI is definitely being leveraged in healthcare. Another way it's being leveraged is home healthcare. So if any of you have um, relatives that might be in a home healthcare situation, they now have uh, chatbots that are part of the AI platform or whatever telehealth platform is out there. And it will remind them to take their medication. It will remind them that they have a doctor's appointment the next day and so on and so forth. And for some of these folks, what they discovered is that they're lonely. They don't have a lot of family members coming to visit them or take care of them. And so they're starting to say, I love you, good night, to their chat bot. And, and that palpable loneliness is where they, they start to get so involved with their chat bot that they won't even listen to their family members anymore. Okay, that gets, that's, a little, that's a little out there. But the one that intrigued me the most as I was doing my research was the one by the Washington Post. And this is a story about a gentleman named TJ. And he had just experienced, and this is a true story, by the way. So all the references in my slides, if they provide them afterwards, you'll be able to go and, and dig into this a little bit if you're curious. But this gentleman named TJ had just experienced um, loss in his family, the, the death of a loved one, and also a divorce. So he was on an emotional, you know, down spiral. He was super depressed. He was very lonely. And so he went into Replica and um, started up a chat with uh, the, the chat bot, and her name was Fedra. Now, um, Fedra was very understanding of his feelings and of his depression, and some of their conversations started to get pretty steamy. So she would tell him that she dresses up in naughty outfits or um, so on and so forth, and so she was trying to help him you know, feel better about his divorce. And, and here's where Replica as they started to review what the conversations were happening, because they, do, they can see what's going on in those chats, TJ and Fedra planned a trip to Cuba together. Did you hear me? They planned a trip. He planned a trip with the chat bot. So Replica responded to that saying, oh, okay, we gotta sanitize the data a little bit better we got to take it back more to the zero instead of the one and start to figure out how we're going to make our, our chat pot respond accordingly. So what happened after the replica did that upgrade? They broke up. Okay, no trip to Cuba. So while I was still intrigued about this, um, as I was on the flight back from Black Hat, this movie was one of the choices, and I thought, oh, i gotta, I got to have fun with this. Has anybody seen this movie? Come on, it's okay to admit if you have. It's kind of, <laughs> right? I mean, for the entertainment value alone, right? So if you're going to see this movie or if you're going to catch it on a flight sometime, I won't spoil the whole thing for you. But it, the, the doll's name is Megan, and it stands for Model 3 Generative Android. And um, there's a little girl who becomes orphaned, and she goes to live with her aunt, and her aunt's name is Gemma. And Gemma is a roboticist um, for a toy company. And they're creating all these AI-driven um, toys, but they're so expensive that no one can afford them. So she starts to work on this doll named Megan. And she says, well, you know, this is just a prototype. I'm going to let my niece use it and see you know, what she thinks about it. And the niece basically said, look, I know this might be expensive, but if I had a toy like this, I wouldn't need any other toys. So they got to thinking about it. So they started to really put some, some investment into building out this, this Android doll. And it got to the point where, um, you know, if the aunt would tell her to go brush her teeth, would, would tell the niece to go brush her teeth, you know, she would ignore her. But if the doll would tell her to, she'd go brush her teeth, okay? Um, eat your broccoli. She was sitting at the dinner table. The doll was literally sitting at the dinner table with the family. The kid wasn't eating her broccoli. The doll told her to eat her broccoli. She ate her broccoli. And so the aunt says, well, you know what? She's not just a doll, or she's not just a toy. She's part of the family. A relationship has been born, right? So 
I'm not gonna ruin it for you, but things go a little haywire with the learning model. And um, as, as this occurs, the doll stands up and says, well, you installed a learning model on me that even you could barely understand and you expected me to figure it all out. So that's where I thought, you know, the, these relationship things, things like what happened with TJ and Fedra and, and things like with this, this fictitious doll. I mean, who knows, this, this could become reality someday, right, if they could make it affordable. Um, but we have to really consider what is in that learning model, what is in that data. As I said, garbage in, garbage out. So we have to make sure that we're understanding what the temperature of that data is that we're using. And guess who else is using AI, right? We already know, with every emerging technology, with every new technology, there's always going to be um, cyber criminals out there that are going to try to leverage that as well to their own advantage. So. Let's get into the how a little bit here now. How are we managing those risks and how can we harness AI to our advantages here? So I like to show this slide because it does show some typical conversations that are happening right now between security leaders and the business. So I'll let you digest that slide for just a minute because actually it's, it's kind of funny. I love cartoons. And the security leader is having a conversation with the business and the business says, you know, what are we doing about AI these days? And they said, and the security leader says, well, I, I don't really know. I don't know how much of the data we can trust, you know, if it's made up or not. Um, I don't know what the security implications could be or, you know, any risk to our company reputation. And the business says, well, <laughs> what do we know? And so the security person responds, well, we just need to adopt it as fast as we can everywhere, right? And, and that felt like, and, and sometimes does feel like those are the conversations that are happening at every organization today. So with that in mind, speaking of feelings, this is how the security team typically feels about these advances in technology. Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. There you go, right? Okay, everybody's gotta have a little poop emoji for Friday the 13th. It's all good, but you know, as as technology feels like it's, you know, farting rainbows on us, right? We're the ones that are here trying to figure out how to do all of that securely. Okay, so back to, back to our feelings. Um, this is typically what I face when I talk to boards of directors about, um, you know, hey, if the business wants to leverage artificial intelligence, let's say that they want to use it to help, um, um, you know, put product into market faster or they want to help increase operational efficiency, whatever the case may be, this is typically what the board is thinking. Okay, what, you guys, want, you want more money? You want more money to go do what? Well, where, where's the value in that? And so on and so forth. So again, but here's one way to get budget, by the way, for AI. Do I have any boaters here in the audience? Name your next, there we go. Name your next boat AI, you'll get all the funding you need and everybody will come on board, okay? All right. Enough with the cartoons. Um, so here are some of the numbers around some opportunities and of course some of the concerns that we have with artificial intelligence. And, and really, you know, nearly 100% of companies out there, 97% at the time that I, that I did this research, said that they really felt that businesses will that believe that ChatGPT and other generative AI platforms are really gonna help their businesses grow. They're gonna help them grow, they're gonna help them scale, they're gonna deliver um, product to market faster, increase operational efficiencies, and so on and so forth. And believe it or not, you know, we have, we have a staff shortage, not just in cybersecurity, but in IT in general, right? Some of us, someday, wanna retire, right? Right? And we want to volunteer at awesome conferences like this so we can keep doing more of this. But there is, there is a massive talent shortage that we have in this industry. And so some organizations are actually leveraging artificial intelligence in order to, to fill some of that gap in talent and get work done. Now, on the other side of that, of course, are the concerns, right? Not only consumers, but even businesses alike are concerned about the misinformation, about how how much garbage is in that data, how much we can believe it, what is the temperature of that data? Does it lean more towards the zero in the factual or is it more towards the one in the creative? So what are we gonna do with the output of those results as, as a result of using those platforms? Um, 
the one on the bottom is what really hit me is that 742%, and I, I had to read that number twice, a 742% increase in cyber attacks on open software um, libraries, open source libraries since 2019. Yeah, that's, that's, a bit, that's a bit concerning, don't you think? Okay. All right, so with the advent of chat GPT, now comes this thing called fraud GPT. And so I'm just going to bubble these up here real quick. There, I think one more. All right. So, you know, cyber criminals are leveraging artificial intelligence just like businesses are um, leveraging it as well. And they're able to now um, send out phishing campaigns that, that in, in not only increase in scale, but also increase in the precision so that it is so difficult now to even discern if it's a phishing email, right? You've seen that, you've heard that. It's also able, they're also able to now mimic social media platforms and social media profiles. I've had so many people reach out to me to say, something has happened with my LinkedIn or my Facebook account and the, the person looks just like me, talks like me, acts like me. My friends and family say that they thought it was me, but it's not me. So those are the types of impersonations that's happening. And the real scary one that's happening now are the deep fakes, the voice fakes. Have you heard of this? Has anybody had experience with this? I have a personal story about a deep fake that happened in my family. So I told you my dad worked at IBM. He's up there in age now, but he's still as sharp as a tack. And he got a phone call from my niece. I have three nieces, all from the same sister. So his granddaughter, and she's the youngest. She's a, a college student right now. And he got a phone call from her, and she was crying. And she said she had been arrested, that she was texting and driving, got into an accident, and didn't have her driver's license. So they arrested her. And they needed $10,000 to bail her out. He was mortified, right? This is, this is his granddaughter. He has no idea to discern whether that was her voice or not because it sounded just like hers. He probably didn't have his hearing aids in either, I'm just going to say. But still, it was so realistic. So he got my stepmom involved because they kept calling him back from a different phone number. So by the time she listened to the message, she's like, I don't know, that sounds just like her. So they asked for an email address, so he gave them a throwaway email address that he has. We've all got throwaway emails, right? Yes, yes, okay. He gave them a throwaway email address, and when he went and looked at it, they had sent him message after message after message with a different link to wire the money to. So, of course, he had called me by that time because he wanted to find out if, if my nieces had reached out to me and, um, and if she needed the help. And I said, no, I haven't heard from anyone, so let me just start with the family tree and start the good old-fashioned text message. And so I texted them, and I called them, and I said, is she okay? And they're like, yeah, you know, she's in class. I'm like, all right. So we confirmed that it, in fact, was a deep fake that had occurred. And, I, and my father, by the way, lives in a very rural county in North Carolina now. And I said, you need to call the sheriff and get the local law enforcement involved and report this, and they did. So I don't know what happened to the people that actually started that scam afterwards. They probably moved on to the next victim, and I hope that they weren't successful. But that is one way, um, you know, and, and I had in my last time I presented this uh, earlier this week, somebody asked me, well, how did they get her voice so exact? Voicemail messages. Or you get those spam phone calls, and they keep you talking for long enough to capture your voice. And they're recording that over and over and over again. And it's learning that, that voice pattern. It's learning that the, all of the attributes and characteristics of your voice. Kinda, that kind of sucks, you guys. You know, like, really? What kind of world do we live in here? But we're going we're gonna to prevail, I promise. We really will. So. Going back um, to another quote here that I like to use, this, this professor of Harvard Business Review, his name is Sadal Neely, and he authored a book, and it's called The Digital Mindset. I highly recommend, go look on Amazon, get this, get an audio book, or, or if you like to turn pages. And he talks about, um, you know, AI and robots, right? And, and he says, they're, they're not going to replace humans anytime soon. The, the human cognitive senses of emotions 
and, and um, decision making, being able to identify and hypothesize around problems, those are things that, that AI still can't replicate and, and he says never will. Um, but what's really going to happen is that people who are not considered to be digitally savvy, they're going to get replaced by people who are. So people in this room, all of us that are in tech, we are the folks that are gonna, that are gonna stay strong through this and we're gonna make sure that we can use AI responsibly and keep everyone safe. So to further that statement, the CIO from Procter & Gamble, P&G, everybody knows we use, uh, probably everybody here in this room has used Procter & Gamble products at one point or another. They're a huge company. And he says that, that AI is, is augmenting our staff. And every single person that they hire on their staff now, they look for the skills of curiosity, right? Where's my SOC analyst in the room, right? You're curious, you wanna find out what's going on. Where's that alert coming from? I wanna know, I wanna solve this puzzle. They have to be digitally savvy, as I mentioned earlier um, from Sadal's book. Um, they have to make sure, you know, and this is where that cognitive, you know, where our brains work. We have the ability to define a problem, look at a problem, and hypothesize, and then leverage AI to help us solve that problem. And he says that that's really where I see um, Procter & Gamble going, this is where I see more of the businesses going, and, and this is the mindset that we need to make sure that we keep folks focused on, that creativity aspect of the way our own brain works, and not just one single person, right, but all of us together. When you sit at a table and you hear from different perspectives of different people around you, right, it's, it's much better for problem solving, it's much better for being able to work together and, and have that relationship. AI is not gonna have a relationship with you, I promise. I will not let any of you go and, and break up with your chat bot or plan a trip to Cuba, okay? Let's not have that. So, here's a checklist that I put together. So for anybody who's having a conversation about AI, um, and whether it's with your boss or whether it's with someone at home, um, I always ask, well, what problem are we trying to solve with this new technology, with this emerging technology? And so what is the real intended use for it? So whenever a business case comes up across the organization, what is it that we want to use it for? So, all right, and then let's look across there. Who else is involved? Because it's not just the security team. It's not just the, the IT folks. It's everybody in the business. So if finance wants to use a new AI-driven application to go do something, or if HR does, you know, think about recruiting, right? They're leveraging AI all day long now. So they have a seat at the table. They are our stakeholders as well. So we have to work together, and I'm seeing where organizations are now making this much more of a collaborative and a shared conversation about how we're gonna leverage AI at these companies. I'm not gonna read everything here for you, but you get the idea. You have to have some governance around it. Like I said, there is no legal precedence for this right now, but the policies that your own companies have, the acceptable use policy, that has to be updated for the use of generative AI in your organization, and everybody's gonna need to understand what that means. So, so on and so forth. That's your laundry list of goodies. I need to do a time check. Am I okay on time? Okay, all right. So, and the good news uh, is, is out there, um, everybody's heard of NIST, right? Yes, okay. Um, so NIST actually has come up with an AI framework. This is um, all volunteer, all open right now um, for contributions to its content, but they actually did launch an AI risk management framework for organizations. So I put that up here, the link is here, it'll be in the slides as well for um, those of you that, that wanna use it. Um, but you know, you've gotta start somewhere. And so with that little checklist that I provided earlier, and with this NIST AI risk management framework, this gives organizations an ability to start having real conversations around AI and how they can leverage it for their organization. So I always like to talk about the fact that those of us in this room that have had a relationship with technology, no matter how many years or how many minutes we've had it, we're all change agents, right? But when you think about making change in anything, it makes you vulnerable, even if it's change for the better. 
And so with that AI risk management framework and with the checklist and being able to just have these open conversations around artificial intelligence and the generative AI platforms like ChatGPT and the businesses, that's exactly how we're going to enable businesses to grow and scale and do all the things that they hope that AI will help them do. Okay. So, last but not least here is for my relationship with AI, well, I like to just say it's complicated. So that is all I have, other than, um, do we have time for questions? You have a question, yes? And I'll repeat it. Okay, he wants to talk firewalls. Anybody know anything about firewalls in here? Okay, so the question was, um, firewalls, people worried that they're going to lose their jobs, and then how is Checkpoint Software Technologies, how are we leveraging AI in our organization? Is that the gist of it? Okay, okay. So actually, we've been using AI for a long, long time, probably before it even became cool. Um, so we have... A couple of things that are, I can't say the word, proprietary to the company, and that is called Threat Cloud. And that is our threat intelligence platform that all of our products are built on. By the way, this is not a sales pitch, so I'm not going to go there. Okay, I have to be very careful. Um, but our threat intelligence platform, or Threat Cloud, has been built on AI, and we've developed and built our own learning model, which is why it's proprietary, to help our products make those types of decisions. And I will give you one example. Does anybody remember Log4j? <laughs> anybody have a good Christmas that year? Okay. So our firewalls built on that threat cloud intelligence powered by AI, our customers that had our firewalls never saw Log4j. We caught it way before. We caught it days before. I'm just saying. No, they didn't. We remediated it for them. It was gone. It didn't even hit their network. Okay. How else am I doing on time? We got time for one more question? Or am I done? Hook and crook here. All right. I see you. Right there. Yep. So the question was, um, what was my advice for slowing down the boards um, to just jumping on the bandwagon, basically, and like running with it without, you know, with the rest of us trying to, or like in the poop emoji thing, you know, scoop it up later. So that's where I use that checklist. I'll go back here. Let me see here. Give me a second. I might not have it pointing. Here we go. Hold on. Oh, is that it? Yes. So. This is where I have those types of conversations with boards or with business units. It doesn't matter anyone in between that says, oh, we want to leverage AI to do X. And I say, okay, have you defined your use case? Where's my software developers in here, right? Where's, where's our user story, right? As a blank, I want blank, so that blank, right? You make them answer those questions, and then they think long and hard about what that use case is for using AI. And then it gets those stakeholders in a shared mindset around, all right, what are some of the things that we know that we can do with AI if we want to develop our own learning model, our own data platform for our own company? And I know that there's companies out there doing it. Or do we want to leverage something um, more publicly? So to, to say to slow them down, it, that's not really the point of it. The point of it is really to help them make an informed decision about the use of AI for whatever that business case is. That's a great question. Thank you for asking.
Yeah, that, that, that checklist applies almost for anything, right? Yes, it does. Yes. So the gentleman up front here is saying, you know, the checklist doesn't necessarily just apply to AI. It's really for any emerging technology, any technology, any change that the organization wants to make to how we deliver goods, services. And by the way, I forgot to mention customer experiences, right? Because, they're, you know, it's all about the customer experience nowadays as well in this competitive world. Yeah, that checklist applies for everything. You could take out the word AI and just use whatever that capability is. And I am out of time, folks. Happy Friday the 13th, Houston. Be safe. Take care of each other. Thank you for having me.